so now we have seen uh, here when the cell um, and can then actually compare the different uh, models in terms of reconstruction error on the test set. So you see that the larger I take my reconstruction, uh, my latent dimensionality, the lower the reconstruction loss becomes, so the better I get in reconstructing. Of course, this then first sounds okay, why don't we just take the largest latent dimensionality? Well, our goal is usually compression, right, to really represent the data the least number of uh, latent dimensions, and this is why it's usually then the trade-off between reconstruction loss and our latent dimensionality we want to take. We can also compare it a bit more visually, because this is a bit abstract, just looking at reconstruction numbers. How does it actually look like? I would reconstruct now images. So you can see here first with the 64 dimensions, well, you see some sort of shape. Uh, so the left one here is always the two image, the right one is the reconstructed one, the same here. So you see some sort of image uh, of a shape, however, you can't really recognize the fork in here. Well, the more you take, the clearer the image becomes, as you can see. And with 384, you just see a little bit of blowy noise on the image. So this is why you really have to look at them and then say, OK, this is sufficient for my application if you would want to use the reconstructions actually or not. Um, and there you see really if you use very little latency, then you also get just very blowy images. However, we want to now analyze a bit more of our autoencoder. So what the autoencoder basically does, it recognizes common feature patterns in your data set and tries to represent them inside your feature vector. And the decoder has to also learn these feature patterns and recreate then the image. However, what happens if we now, for example, put out of distribution images in? So images that really don't fit at all to our training. The one we use here is when if I just take random noise, and then you see actually this noise is not well reconstructed. Why that? Um, well, because this is something the network hasn't seen, and it tries to apply its patterns it has seen in the cipher data set. On this input, you see that it doesn't really find any, and therefore also our output is it looks less than typical noise, also because it makes this everything blurry, but it sees some patterns in there that we probably don't see in here. So this shows that the autoencoder, if you now do it on completely out of distribution data, it probably doesn't work. However, like usually you don't want to encode when pure noise, right? Still, it's something good to check. We can also check when other specific things, like if we take in just a plain image, that actually works well. If you take a different color, you sometimes see here a bit of noise, however, especially at borders. So if you have clear-cut borders, like we have in this example image, see that the reconstruction here is especially in these gray areas not good. Why that? Well, because the network has used the mean squared error loss, right? So it's much more dangerous to shift this image by one. So the border, if the border is not exactly correct, that has a very high loss compared to if I would do a blurry border. This has a lower loss and therefore we have these artifacts in here. The same if you do here some color transition, you see that it really has problems to get a smooth color transition also because it hasn't seen it in the data set. Another question is, for example, can we use also autoencoders to generate new images? Because this is something that for example, variational autoencoders are good. Also, the problem with autoencoders compared to variational autoencoders is that we don't know the distribution of a latent dimensionality. Right? So VAEs usually create a random latent vector, push it through the decoder, and get a reconstruction. In autoencoders, we don't give any constraints to the model. So in variational autoencoders, you usually say the latent dimensionality has to be uh, like a Gaussian. However, here we don't have any constraints, so we don't know the distribution. And what happens if we would assume, well, the latent dimension is probably something like a latent Gaussian. How about we sample from it and reconstruct? Well, then you get these reconstruction out. And there you also see that it's not something we are looking for. This is not an image which looks anyway similar to Cypher. This shows, yes, autoencoders are not generative by itself. Um, they can however, still reconstruct images. So if you get the input 
to the encoder, then the encoder still finds these spots in the latent dimensionalities in the code, which uh, fit well for the decoder. So there are some dependencies we are not aware of, and this is why we get these weird images in here. Another application of autoencoders I wanted to look at is finding visually similar images. So as, as we have said, so before we have now looked at if a model can compress the latent dimensionality well, um, or the images basically well into latent dimensionality, now we look at can we actually compare the images now based on their latent encoding. This is helpful because we don't have to do it anymore in pixel space, right, but can do it hopefully in semantic space where we actually see patterns and not just pixel values. I've rerun the cell uh, before here, so what we do is we take the training images, we encode all the training images, and we encode all the test images, and then we take now always one test image and try to find the most similar training images based on the similarity of latent encoding. So I encode all of them here in Z, which is their latent code, and if I want to find a similar image, what I do here is I take the Euclidean distance or you could also, for example, take the cosine distance between all the latent vectors with one query vector. I call this, so for example, one test image, which I want to see which are the similar images in, um, in the training set. And if we do that here for a few images, we see the following. So we see already some clustering also of classes. If we put in here, for example, a ship, we also get all ships back, right? For example, here, airplane, but still over water. And you see that this is not necessarily just about uh, the pixel values, right? So yes, for example, also the fork here gets everything with a green background, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the pixel values most similar image, right? And what we actually also see is here below, if we, this is a test image, the left one, so always the left ones are the query test images. We see that actually the training images had two times that image just slightly different in the training set. That's not a good practice, uh, but that's actually something you can identify if you do an auto encoder. That's quite a nice thing. Um, if you would just compare them on pixel value, they probably would have not <coughs> matched too well, because you see that here the um, our, well, our sky here has a different color than the sky here. So therefore they might have not matched, uh, but the auto encoder actually does that. So this is pretty nice because then you can see already some things. Like here you also see that some uh, classes are already grouped. So it can show that auto encoding can be used as a pre-training task or transfer learning to classification. Or if it has never seen any labels, right? But it has also then things like this car here with a red background is then suddenly classed, uh, grouped with some frogs and cats have anything that has a reddish background. Um, so this is, for example, something where you would have then really to train the model for classification because these things, well, it doesn't really pay attention to it, right? The final part here of our notebook will be that we now look at clustering. So vi finding visually similar images, we have seen before, okay, if we take a single query image, which are our similar ones, but actually we can now cluster image, right? We just can take the latent vectors of each image and try to create a cluster. Um, then we, for example, see which ones are really similar in one bubble and which ones are less similar there. TensorBot actually helps us with that because it has clustering algorithms like PCA and TSNE already implemented and provides us a very fancy nice visual um, interface. We can just do that. We create here a new summary writer, and then I use the writer.add embedding function, where I put it all uh, our test images. Um, I put in more metadata, so I add actually the labels to the image just uh, to show what uh, class it has been, in case we want to see it. Uh, we don't use that here for any clustering algorithm or whatever. And we also put in the original images because then TensorBot can show us that. So how does that look like? If you run TensorBot and open the projector, it looks as follows. You see then here, this is a whole bubble of images and this is a PCA clustering of our all test images. So this is in three dimensions, lower projected of our uh, 128 original input embedding size. Then you can see here in 
Tensorboard, you can really go around, click on single images, and then you see which are the closest points. Uh, in Colab, it doesn't work too well, so here usually come the original images, but you see that here it um, selects you all the very similar images uh, with the label here, so that we see actually I selected one image with uh, class 0 and all the other images, many of them are also class 0. Uh, and you also see that basically it uh, classes these visual similar images, right? You can really see this blue bubble here and here this greenish bubble in Cypher because of um, different classes and images we have taken. So here you can play around more. It's really interesting in TensorBot um, to do this PCA and you can also select GS and E and so on. They are a bit computational heavy. So this is why um, Google Colab sometimes doesn't work too well with them, but I would recommend just to play around a bit. And this is very useful in many applications where you, for example, have embeddings or autoencoding. So finally, we have then reached the end of the notebook. In a conclusion, we have now seen how an autoencoder can be implemented and what it can be used for. So an autoencoder already consists of two parts, an encoder and a decoder. We take an input image, encode it into a lower dimension space, and again decode it. This way we learn to compress images. And on this compressed representation, we can do different things. We can, for example, then really use it as a compression algorithm, but we can also use it as a latent lower dimension representation on which we can do then something like uh, image query searching. So for example, Google's image search uses something similar, but it first compresses the image and then tries to find similar ones. However, they can be also used on different algorithms, so they don't have to do, for example, autoencoder. Um, but this way you could, for example, build an image search engine. Same way you can cluster images to find, for example, very similar images and uh, tools like TensorBot really helps you to do this. Hopefully then with this tutorial it's a bit clearer what an autoencoder is and then you can take the next step of looking at a variational autoencoder.